Oh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's good afternoon, I guess. Uh, it's almost noon, right? Uh, so this is the Springs Academy Tuesdays at the Florida Springs Institute. Uh, it's August the 1st, uh, 2017. I'm Bob Knight. I'm the director of the Institute and uh, your instructor today. Um, and I really appreciate you coming. It's good to have a lot of new people here. Um, and we're always trying to get people into the Springs Institute to learn more about Springs. So uh, if you have a chance or haven't looked around yet, be sure to look around and pick up some of our information. Um, I'm going to this is the fifth in, in a series of six lectures uh, that I give during the year. And um, today is sort of the most depressing of all the lectures. It's really about the stresses, the impacts that are occurring and affecting our springs. And so uh, have all of you been to spring? Has anybody not been to a spring in this group? So everybody's been, you, you haven't been to a spring before? Uh, OK. Uh, has any, anybody been to Itchtuckney Springs? You raise your hand if you've been to Itchtuckney. Okay, most of you have. Yeah, okay. And uh, of course, you may have heard of Ginny Springs on the Santa Fe River. Um, uh, we're surrounded by springs here. In fact, High Springs is named after a spring, which I understand doesn't flow anymore, uh, but I, it was the water supply for the town at one time. Um, and, but we're in the, a big concentration of springs, so that's why the Spring Center is here. And um, we have data now that show about a million people a year go by this office on their way to recreate in the springs. So about a million people a year. There's a lot of various types of commerce going by here, but a lot of the cars have kayaks and canoes and paddle boards on them, and that's because people are enjoying the springs. It's a very big part of the economy here. It may be the biggest part uh, in the future, if not already. So that's, that's why we're here, and that's why I want to talk about Springs. These are the lectures that we give. We always give them on uh, the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, and the reason we do that is because the Great Outdoors has a special on hamburgers. It's half price hamburger day. And so anybody that wants to go to the outdoor, Great Outdoors with me afterwards, we usually go there for lunch if you'd like to do that. And I'm not paying, I'm afraid, but uh, you're welcome to come, and the hamburgers are cheap. Uh, it's the best, one of the best restaurants in town. So in April, this round of six classes, we started in April and we took, gave an overview. We talked about the springs hydrogeology. That's basically how the, where the water comes from, how the water gets to the springs. Uh, we talked about chemistry and that's in terms of the oxygen in the water, the temperature, the conductivity, the nutrients, the contaminants. Uh, we had a lecture about biology and it was given by Rob Matson with the St. John's River Water Management District last month. Uh, he's a, a colleague of mine that uh, has been studying springs for decades uh, about the, the algae, the plants, and the wildlife. Um, today I'm going to talk about the stresses that are affecting springs, uh, the two biggest being uh, groundwater pumping and the use of nitrogen fertilizers um, uh, that uh, leach into the groundwater. And then the next and the last class of this round will be about advocacy in terms of, um, you know, if we're going to protect the springs, we've got to essentially do it ourselves with the help of the state. But we don't have the leadership of the state right now in terms of protecting springs. So citizens have to be more knowledgeable to better speak up to protect the springs. And that's one reason for this course is to try to train people to do that. Uh, I've been studying springs on and off since the 1970s. Um, I got my, um, I've got a bunch of degrees from colleges. Uh, for my PhD, I studied Silver Springs in 1979 and 80, and that's what really, I went to Silver Springs the first time in 1953 with my grandparents, because I lived in Jacksonville at that time, um, and saw Silver Springs, what it looked like in the 50s. Uh, and then I went back and I got to spend several blissful years um, swimming in Silver Springs and collecting data from there in 79 and 80. Uh, I've written a book a couple years ago as part of the Springs Institute. I wanted to, uh, it's another way of raising awareness about springs. And so there we have those for sale here uh, or for a contribution. Uh, but the purpose of the class is really to inform lay people, uh, people that aren't necessarily scientists, although we have scientists come in all the time, uh, but more about springs. So you know enough about springs to uh, know why they're important to you and why they're important to our society, why they're important to High Springs, the whole town of High Springs. The economy is booming now because of the springs, really, and the rivers. Uh, and then what we need to do to protect them. And that has got to be, a lot of that comes from the ground up. 
And so that, I'm trying to inform you of those issues for that reason. We really started learning about springs with Dr. Odom uh, when he came to University of Florida in 1950. Um, that's, a, that's an ancient time ago, what's that? Almost 70 years ago. Uh, he um, studied, he decided to study Silver Springs. He was a, a young uh, biology professor and he decided Silver Springs is the place to go. Well, he, he published landmark papers and studies about Silver Springs that really raised awareness about springs worldwide. There have been no other studies uh, about springs, holistic studies. He brought a lot of scientists together to do that work and really thoroughly described Silver Springs and about 40 other springs in the state of Florida. He, he went and collected data on a lot of different springs and, and wrote the definitive book. So he's really the father of the ecology of springs. Um, what he, he wasn't even aware of at that time that we have over a thousand springs in Florida and so we call it the land of a thousand springs. Uh, like in Minnesota, they call it land of 10,000 lakes. You know, well, this is, our, this is our label we're trying to put on this area. It's the land of a thousand springs. This, this map only has 300 and some on it. All thousand springs are on the, the, the um, Google Earth map back there that you can put on your computer. And so you can go every spring, open it up, look exactly where it is, um, see what the water quality is, see a photograph of it if we have a photograph. Uh, see what its name is. Uh, but you've heard of some of the big ones, like Silver. Has anybody been to Silver Springs here? Some of you have. Um, which it's Tuckney, we already talked about. Wakulla is up in Tallahassee. It's the one all our legislators see. And they go party there all the time. Uh, Wikiwachi, the land of the mermaids, Wakaiva. And, and there's springs everywhere in North Florida. If there was a national park for springs, it would be here in North Florida, uh, because there is no place else like this. Dr. Odom recognized the fragility of these springs in the 50s when he worked there. He realized a, a one major spring, Kissingen Spring in Polk County, dried up um, at the time he was working there. Hello, we're started, come on in. Yeah, I've been visiting, can I park across the street? Yeah, yeah, in a marked area. Yeah. Please, yeah. Um, so what he said is a long history of permanency. What he found out and what he published was the springs are like, everybody thought they were eternal. I mean, they've, as long as anybody can remember, the springs flowed. Silver Springs has always been flowing as long as people lived in Florida, or at least, at least the last 10,000 years. Um, and the springs were always flowing, they're eternal. And yet, he found that they're not eternal. Uh, and there was a case history that right in the 1950s, when phosphate mining came into Polk County and started pumping a lot of groundwater, the springs stopped flowing. We had, they had a spring that was as big as Jenny Springs, bigger, twice as big as Jenny Springs, that was a major recreation spot, Kissingen Springs. It just stopped flowing when they pumped the groundwater level down. In other words, a spring isn't there by magic. The spring is there because there's water in the ground that feeds the spring. And I'll show you a little bit about that. And, and so it's, it's not just that pumping. This is Silver Glen Springs, if you don't recognize it. Uh, it's not just the pumping, it's other things too. And, the result is, as we get this kind of picture, and John Moran took these pictures on the back wall here. John Moran took these pictures. He's been doc photo documenting the health of our springs uh, for uh, quite a while now. And these are just pictures of Sil the Silver River about uh, two miles downstream from the Head Spring. This is what it looked like in 1990. This is what it looked like a few years ago. This is what it looked like the other day. I was there last week and it's green again. Silver Springs. Is, was a blue water spring in the 70s when I worked there. In the 50s when I was there, it was beautiful with a, a shiny bottom of sand and shells. And now it's green. Uh, the water is actually, fit, has organic matter that's making it optically green because the organic matter is absorbing the blue wavelengths. And so the river actually looks green. It's covered with vegetation and algae. Um, and I'll show you more about Silver Springs towards the end. I sort of use it as a case history of, of a lot of everything really that's going wrong with our springs. Um, so the two bigger, two big stresses I'm going to talk about are um, the stress on the springs flows, which is the, the it's, we call it the discharge of water or the flow of a spring. Uh, and, and those stresses come from groundwater. Uh, the human side of those stresses come from groundwater pumping. And we use groundwater for almost all our water uses. If you live anywhere in North Florida, you're using groundwater. Um, very few people are using surface water for anything. 
Everybody has a well. The cities have wells. Um, you buy bottled water that comes from wells. About 99% of the water we use up here is from the aquifer, from the limestone aquifer below our feet. And that's in an earlier class. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but basically we're right under our feet is solid limestone, except it's full of caves. It's not completely solid and it has water in it. And that a lot of water in the aquifer and it's easy to pump out. And you can put a well anywhere in North Florida and hit the Florida aquifer and get potable water. So everybody's doing that. We're doing it for agriculture. And agriculture never used groundwater for irrigation 50, 60 years ago. Now it's one of the, it's, it's like rainfall doesn't even exist anymore. You know, it's, well, let's irrigate it if we want to have intensive agriculture. Uh, golf courses, of course, urban uses, fountains and things like that. We just, just pretend like water is infinite. You know, there's an infinite amount and we can use all we want uh, without being uh, conserving the groundwater. Well, groundwater, it turns out, is our most precious water because it's the most pure water. It's stored for us essentially in a giant underground water tank and distribution system. Uh, it's incredibly, it gives Florida incredible economic benefits to have a plumbing system that you can go anywhere in North Florida from Orlando North and put down a well as little as 100 feet or less and hit potable water anywhere. And if it's a big well, you can pump a million gallons a day out of it, out of a single well. So it's that, because of that abundance of water, we've come to accept it as being infinite and treat it like that. And that is part of our problem. It turns out it's not. Um, so some people say, well, you know, we're not using any more now than we were 10 years ago. And if you look at this graph, you see in terms of groundwater use in Florida for public water supply, it, it sort of is leveling off in terms of the overall numbers. Uh, but in 1950, we were using uh, less than 200 million gallons a day. Now we're using, uh, for public supply, now we're using over 2 billion gallons a day. It's enormous increase in the amount we're using. So where did that water come from that we extracted? Well, it turns out it came from springs. It came from spring flow. Uh, the water that is in the ground and where rain recharges the aquifer, that water used to flow out of springs, all of it. That's the only way water got out of the aquifer. Those were the overflow points. Well, now we have several million wells in North Florida that are also, every one of them is like a spring. So if you have a private well and you turn it on, that water coming out is water that would have come out of a spring if you didn't have the well. And we have a lot of wells. We're using a lot of water. Um, and and it's, there's still water coming out of most of the springs, but there's less. It has to be less because this is the water that would have come out of the springs if we didn't pump it. Ag is, um, overall, is a, a, almost half of the water use in terms of these numbers. Uh, it's, this is for the whole state. It's less than half, but in North Florida, it's about almost half of the water use. Um, the state has uh, a, a system of permitting the largest water uses, and it's a system that's a model system it's been proclaimed as you know this is the way every state should do water control the water in florida is owned by everybody in the state it's not privately owned none of it's privately owned um, even you know you have right to pump it but you don't own it uh, the state owns it everybody owns it um, so the state has a permit system for the largest wells they just don't worry about any well that's less than about a hundred thousand gallons a day a typical person uses about 100 gallons a day, but you can go out and if you have some land and you have, you know, you want to grow something, you can get, you don't even have to get a, 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 a you can just get a, a general permit uh, for less than 100,000 gallons a day. You can put it any well in the ground uh, without a permit that's less than six inches in diameter. And you can pump a lot of water out of a four or five inch well. But the, just the permitted ones, the largest ones, there's about 29,000 permitted wells just in the North Florida area. This is the area where uh, the aquifer feeds the springs. This is the springs region. It's basically from Tampa over here all the way out to the Panhandle. And there's about 29,000 of these permitted systems. That, there's a lot more wells than that, actually. Uh, but that's how many permits are out there. Uh, those permits are, are not the whole water use. Uh, but the estimated pumping from this entire area is about 2.6 billion gallons a day of pumping. Like I said, about a, about a billion is for um, 
uh, public supply and about a billion is for agriculture and then the rest is for commercial industrial uses like mining. Uh, but the allocated amount of water being pumped that could be pumped from those wells if, if everybody was following the rules is 4.6 billion. It's twice as much as what they think is actually being pumped now. And so I'm going to be talking today about impacts of excessive pumping at today's pumping levels. If we actually go up to these limits, in which everybody's trying to do right now by bringing in more farms, getting more permits, um, things are going to be much worse than what I'm describing today. This isn't just a sad story. This is a disaster that we're faced with. In the next generation, you young folks that are here, we're, we're leaving you a real mess to do something about. Or you're going to have a much more expensive future when you've got a, a very impacted Floridan aquifer. So you can see the intensity of these things. The big users are in the Southwest Florida Water Management District, about a billion gallons of water a day on average. And that's an average year. A wet year, people use less water for irrigation. A dry year, people use a lot more water. So they're probably using two billion gallons a day during a dry year, like the end of last year. Uh, St. John's is about a billion gallons a day. Swanee River is only less than 400 million gallons a day, but still a lot of water. Uh, you can actually look by counties, uh, and you can see on this map, you can see uh, which counties are using the most water and what, how they're using that water. So of these counties in the Springs region of Florida, Polk County is using the most, about a quarter of a billion gallons a day. That's the circle right here. Uh, the different colors, the green is agriculture, about half of that's for agriculture, about a quarter of it's for public supply, and the other fourth, which is not typical of all these pies, is for commercial industrial mining. It's phosphate mining. So that's where that gray is. About, it's about a fourth of a quarter of a, a billion gallons a day of water be, is being used for phosphate mining. Um, Orange County, much more of a developed uh, urban type uh, county, also using a quarter of a billion gallons a day, uh, but three-fourths of it's used for public supply and, and a lot less. Agriculture used to be big in Orange County when it was citrus, you know, that, <laughs> it's called Orange County. Not because it was orange, but because they were growing oranges there. You probably don't remember, it's all before the time of the young people in here when it was all orange groves. You'd drive through middle Florida, it was amazing. But not anymore, but now it's all people and houses. Um, and you come up to Alachua County, we're, we're one of the biggest counties up here. Uh, Duval's a really big one uh, with Jacksonville, uh, and that's mostly public supply. But then there's, see the gray here, that's, um, that's paper mills that are Fernandina Beach and places like that. Nassau County, see it's paper mills. Hamilton County, the gray is a, a big phosphate mine. Taylor County is Buckeye Cellulose, uh, a, a, a paper mill again. Uh, those are interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those later. Gilchrist, Dixie, I mean hardly any, but this is mostly agricultural. These counties are very agricultural. Suwannee County. Um, so anyway, you get, you get the picture. Um, this doesn't seem like much water, but this basically if we put the water to use uh, for people, we could probably have 10 times as many people in Florida and still use the same amount of water as what we're using now. We're just taking an awful lot of our water, our very valuable water, and using it for agriculture right now and for irrigating our lawns. We're using about a fourth, about half of the public water supply is being used just for irrigating outside lawns, which is a wasteful practice when it rains in Florida, right? So. We might not want to irrigate our lawns anymore. It would be a smart thing to do is to cut way back on lawn irrigation. So I'm just going to show you some case history numbers. This is uh, the Wakiva Springs shed. Remember I said Wakiva Springs is this is Orlando, and Wakiva Springs is right on the north side of Orlando. It's the head of the Wakiva River that flows north to the St. Johns River. A Rock Springs. Anybody go to Rock Springs? Anybody ever been to Rock? One of you. Anybody been to Wakiva Springs? You and a few of you. Um, Okay, so there's 40-some springs in this area. They make a, a river that flows about uh, somewhere around 150 million gallons a day. That river is all spring flow. It's a spring-fed river. And these are the permits that are uh, in that spring shed. The spring shed is the area of groundwater of the aquifer that feeds water to these springs in the Wakiva area. And there's about 1,000 groundwater permits just in that one spring shed. They authorize almost a billion gallons a day of pumping, just those permits. Now, they're not, they're not pumping that much. They're pumping about half that. But you can just get the idea of what 
what happens to a spring when you start pumping, you know, hundreds of millions of gallons a day of water? Well, you can look at the data for Wekaiva. These are the actual flow data by year for the Wekaiva Springs, these green dots. Uh, they set a minimum flow and level uh, years ago. This was the first min minimum flow and level set for a Florida spring back in the 90s of uh, about 62 cubic feet per second, uh, which is another way of measuring flow. And these are the actual data. So the, the river's flow was over that and over that and over that, whoa, over that and getting below it and getting below it. And it crossed that line around 2005. And it's still going down. The flows are still going down in the Wakaiva River. And that's not surprising because we've got basically, we're giving people a right to pump a billion gallons a day out of that spring shed. And not all that water gets evaporated, but a lot of it never makes it back into the groundwater. So uh, this is typical of many of our springs. We're seeing these declining flows over time. And, you know, extrapolate this line out, and it would indicate if we, everything keeps going the same rate, Wakaiva Springs is going to be dry in, you know, 2050 or something. It's going to stop flowing. That's so, um, and, and it could be worse than that, or it could be better. Um, but that's just where it's going. So let me talk more about the whole system. I, I, this limestone under our feet is called the Floridan Aquifer, Floridan Aquifer. Uh, there it is right there. It's a system. It's basically a, a, a mass of limestone that extends under all of Florida, all the way up to South Carolina, up to Hilton Head area of South Carolina, all the way out to the Panhandle and into Alabama and Mississippi, and across a large part of Georgia here. It's 100,000 square miles. It's a, one of the biggest aquifers in the world uh, in terms of area and amount of water. Uh, well, the levels in the aquifer are going down. This is a graph from one station, uh, the Lake Butler well, I think is this one. And uh, anyway, the water levels are going down over time. And the spring flows are, are related to water level. That's how, that's where flow comes from is water levels. So, hey John, welcome. Um, so anyway, those are, this is from a USGS report, uh, Williams, and uh, what, he, what he, they're estimating as of 2000, the total pumping from the whole Florida aquifer is about 3.6 billion gallons a day. Uh, the total inflow on average to the Florida aquifer is about 12 billion gallons a day, 11 and 12 billion gallons a day. So we're pumping approximately 30% um, of the total inflow to the aquifer. So that's 30% that is not coming out of springs, roughly, as a rough estimate. And I'll show you more numbers about that. And that's the kind of effect we're seeing. If you actually map out the levels of water in the aquifer uh, pre-development, uh, based on the data we have versus uh, in 2000, uh, uh, this map, so the difference in how the water levels have changed, the water levels have gone down, I showed you in some areas, gone up in some areas too. But the, the main areas where the aquifer levels have gone down are the areas of big pumping. And Tampa and Polk County is one area I showed you, very intensive groundwater use, um, about a quarter of a billion gallons a day in both of those counties. Um, and that's caused a very large reduction, up to uh, 20 to 60 feet of lowering of the aquifer levels. And so that's really cut back the flow of the springs that are in that, in that area, um, and also some along the coast. This is a Silver Spring spring shed. It stretches all the way from Gainesville all the way down to the villages. And that, you see most of that's pink, uh, which indicates a lowering of about 4 to 20 feet. So Silver Springs, the aquifer around Silver Springs has been lowered between 4 to 20 feet. And Rainbow Springs has gone down some. Um, this is the Gainesville pumping center right here. Um, this is Jacksonville area. And so you see drawdowns in Jacksonville 20 to 60 feet. So in Orlando, the, about 30 feet of drawdown. Those are what's affecting spring flows. And there's some areas that are actually green, which is pretty interesting, because I'm looking at the Suwannee Basin right now, and the spring flows are pretty steady in the middle of Suwannee for the whole period of record. It's just amazing. In fact, they look like they may be going up, and I think I'm attributing that now to the reduced pumping at PCS phosphate and the, the Buc Buckeye cellulose. They've both cut back on their pumping, and so there seems to be a rebound of aquifer levels in that area. Um, so here's the actual flow data at Silver Springs uh, over the whole period. This starts in 1932. Rainbow and Silver have a very long flow record. These are annual totals, the blue, dot, the blue diamonds here. And uh, this is a long-term average flow at Silver Springs. 
the average flow at Silver Springs was over 800 cubic feet per second, which is 500 million gallons a day, a billion, half a billion gallons a day, up until the 1980s uh, when it started declining uh, really precipitously. And silver is just going down with no bottom in sight right now. This, um, the, the average for this year now is 382. So that, this line has come all the way down to here, uh, 382 so far for this year for in CFS. Rainbows um, always track silver. It was always, silver was always the largest spring in Florida in terms of flow. Rainbow is the second largest. Uh, it's been tracking for a very long time with about 40 million gallons a day less. Uh, but now rainbows coming down also, but not as fast as silver. So silver is actually um, a past rainbow and is now not the biggest spring anymore in Florida. It's, got, it's uh, lower than rainbow in terms of average flow. And the combined flow reduction is about 300 million gallons a day in those two springs based on actual data. So what does this mean for the whole state? Well, we combined all the flow data for all the springs in the state and came up with a rough water balance for the springs in Florida. There's, there were 1,021 springs recorded. Uh, we're in the St. John's River Water Management District here. There's 151 springs, recorded springs in this area of the Santa Fe and the Suwannee River. Uh, the Swan, the, I mean, here's 314 springs. The St. John's has 151. Northwest Florida has over 300. And here are their historic flows, the best data we have. About 10 and a half billion gallons a day of water was coming out on average from these springs uh, at the turn of the last century. Uh, about 7 billion gallons a day is coming out now based on flow measurements. So we've lost about 3 billion gallons a day. All of them have gone down. Uh, the percent reduction is about 32% for all the springs. Uh, that's uh, based on an analysis up through, uh, actually through 2010. The last, this is done, was done in decades, so 2000, 2010 is the last decade. And that, that's just the, the numbers we have. Uh, individual springs are more or less than that. Uh, this, what's happening is flow, and, and this aquifer is all interconnected. So it doesn't matter where you pump in the aquifer, you're affecting the aquifer levels. And when you affect the aquifer levels anywhere, it affects them everywhere. There's no boundaries below ground. There's no walls between these different uh, water management districts. Hey, welcome. Are you coming in for the lecture? No, I was just checking the Yeah, do you want to go in next door? And okay. You can knock on the door there. Pardon? Just knock on that door and yeah. Um, there, okay. So it doesn't, it doesn't, you can't just look at a spring shed and figure out uh, what pumping is affecting that, that spring, like Silver Springs. You have to look regionally uh, at the pumping over the whole area. And that's, uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, unfortunately, the models don't do that very well. But what, what it, they indicate, if you actually look at the individual spring sheds, like the St. John's River Water Management District has a 22% reduction in spring flows documented through measurements from springs. They're pumping 970, they were in 2010, about uh, 980 million gallons a day. In terms of the amount of recharge to the Florida aquifer in that water management district, that's well over half of the recharge in that district is being pumped. And yet their spring flows are only down 22%. Those two things don't jive. The only way this could only be down 22% is if their springs are attracting water from outside the water manager district. In, in Swanee, you see that they're uh, pumping a very a relatively small amount, 219 million gallons a day, which is only 7% of their recharge, but their springs are down 48%. So the Swanee River basically, Swanee River Basin, including Santa Fe River, we're feeding water to these other springs through this regional hydrogeology. We're feeding water that goes to Silver Springs and and pumping as far away as Jacksonville uh, is affecting flows in the Suwannee River and the Santa Fe River. Uh, pumping in Tampa, as I'm sure, is affecting Silver River and Rainbow River. So uh, we're all interconnected. This is just, you, know, you learn this back in science sometime, everything's connected. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we're not treating the resource the same way. We still got, uh, we got our artificial political boundaries, but we don't really talk about the, uh, the lack of physical boundaries. So is that depressing enough? I'm sorry, I'm trying to cheer you up. Um, part two, nutrients and algae. Has anybody been to a spring and seen algae in a spring? John, I bet you've seen some. 
Uh, anyway, yeah, there's a lot of algae in our springs that wasn't there. It, 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 you're not, well, many of you aren't old enough, but some of us are old enough to remember what the springs look like without this algae or without, this is Mill Pond Springs at Itchitucknee, uh, surprisingly. So um, part of the reason for that algae production we know is nitrogen, which is a pollutant in our water. It's a pollutant in our groundwater uh, that's getting in there from whatever we do on the land, whether it's, I don't see urban things on here, but poultry farms, dairy farms, cropland, they're all big contributors to the nitrogen pollution in the limestone. So this is the limestone. There's groundwater moving around. There really are under, underground rivers in the limestone. And uh, are any of you scuba divers? Any, any of you been? Yeah, so some of you have been in caves and actually believe that. Try swimming upstream in some of those. There really is a lot of water moving below ground. Uh, each crop has a different nitrogen requirement. Uh, IFAS, the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, you know, recommends crop fertilization rates. Uh, many farmers put more nitrogen on than the crop recommendations. Uh, but even if you put it on the amount that's indicated by IFAS, it's usually way too much in terms of what's going, going into the groundwater. You lose a lot of nitrogen. It leaches past the, the roots. And so some crops are use much more nitrogen than others, or the farmers use much more, and some lands they use more. The overall average that's typical is about 200 pounds of nitrogen applied as fertilizer per acre per year. That's, that's the number that I've seen the most. Um, but there's some that are 100, there's some that are 1,000, uh, and then there's other land uses. But nitrogen fertilizer, nitrogen is, a, is uh, in fertilizer, it's essentially man-made uh, nitrate made from gas um, and, and you know, any of you know how much nitrogen is in the air that you breathe? I know. How much? 80%. 80% of this air that we're surrounded with is nitrogen. It's inert. It doesn't affect us. It's not toxic to us. It's nitrogen gas, N2, um, but uh, we can't see it. We can't taste it. We can't smell it. Um, and, but it is a very important part of what's in the air right here. We're breathing it constantly. But nitrogen has many different forms, and the form that's in the two forms that are in fertilizer are different than the nitrogen gas, but they can be manufactured from the nitrogen gas. So if you run electricity uh, in, a, in a process, the Haber process, uh, you actually fix nitrogen gas into ammonia, uh, which is a, one of the forms of nitrogen used in fertilizer. So ammonia is a, a very, what we call a reduced form of nitrogen. It takes a lot of energy to make ammonia. And then nitrate is a derivative from ammonia. Um, and ammonia, you can smell. That's what you smell sometimes in car wash, you know, in windshield wiper stuff. And, and in clean cleansers, some cleansers have ammonia, like uh, window spray. Um, nitrate, you can't smell. You can't see it. it. And when it's dissolved in water, it's completely invisible. It's tasteless. Uh, and that's the form of nitrogen that's getting to the springs is nitrate. And that's what I'll, I'll be talking about more. So this is, this is just west of here. This is the Gilchrist County line. It's Alachua County, Gilchrist County right here. This is a map. This is the Santa Fe River. The Jenny Springs group is right here. Um, uh, Poe Springs is right there. Uh, Blue Springs is right there. Uh, Rum Island and, and other springs are right here. So this is a map actually of the groundwater levels. And the uh, levels, uh, you can see that generally the levels are higher in the south and then they're lower towards the river. That's the way groundwater moves in this area. So when it rains south of 340, south of Poe Springs, uh, that water filters into the ground, goes down in the aquifer, but the direction of flow is to the north towards the springs on the Santa Fe River. And that's what we call the groundwater flow gradient. And that's, that's how the water gets to all these springs. There's a very large concentration of springs in that part of the Santa Fe River. Well. Uh, the state is doing a study of this area. They've set this up as an experimental area. It's, a, it's an area that's farmed intensively. Um, they said, we're going to study it. We're going to get some baseline data, background data that shows what the nitrogen is in the groundwater and, uh, and how that nitrogen is getting to the springs. And then we're going to go have the farmers implement best management practices and prove their farming practices so that we'll reduce the nitrogen. We can see what benefits we're going to get. So I'm just going to show you a little data from that study. Here's a well, monitoring well number seven. So these are wells where they drill a hole in the ground down in the limestone and, and pull water up and measure how much nitrogen is in it and other things. 
So there's well number seven, here's well number 12, well number nine, well number eight. Um, and these are the elevations of the potential, basically the water elevation, the groundwater elevations in those wells. That's how they made this map of the potentiometric or groundwater surface is 30 feet, 28 feet, 26, 24. And then you're at, when you're at the river, you're about 20 feet above sea level there. And so the water, the groundwater is flowing this way. Uh, so just remember wells 12 and 7 here. And let's look and see where those wells are located. And then here's wells 11, 1, and 4. So there's 20-some there's wells here. These are the data for all those wells uh, during the first few years of the study. This is up through 2015. Well, number there's, these are nitrate levels, all these little uh, bar graph, it's called. And each well has been sampled, at the, this time it had been sampled eight times uh, over a two-year period every quarter. And see, so this well is very low. It's about less than one to two milligrams per liter of nitrate and nitrogen. One to two, this one goes up to four, three or four. This one goes up to five. This one goes up to about three. Well seven goes up to about uh, 25 to 30 milligrams per liter, parts per million. This is the drinking water standard. In other words, this is supposed to be the safe drinking water standard, 10 parts per million. Um, well nine, uh, lower uh, well 10 up to five, which is high. Uh, well 11 up right to 10. And then well 12 is up to 50 uh, during this time period. Now, since then, they've monitored another year and a half and it's up to 70 now, that, that well. And so uh, that's what the groundwater is, at where that well is. And then you got another low well, you got another high well above the standard, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what is different about 12 and seven that is, um, th these are the highest ones. Well, there's a dairy at 12. This is the well is right here, and the dairy is right up gradient from it. Uh, and then there, there's yard waste that's been buried there. We have our, the expert here, uh, Dr. Del Botcher, has been studying this area, but there's maybe multiple sources of, of contamination, but there's a dairy here. There's also a dairy for well seven. Those two wells have the highest levels. They have dairies. We're studying a spring on the Santa Fe River further downstream from Itchtuckney. It's over 60 parts per million. It's called, not trout, troop spring and it's got a dairy right next to it. Okay, they're really high nitrogen levels around some land uses. Irrigated vegetables, pastures, row crops, all these things use fertilizer and they all uh, can contribute to these high nitrogen levels. The other thing is, this is a residential area. In other words, there's people, every one of these properties has a well. Every one of them that's occupied has a well. So they're drinking, or their water supply is high and if they haven't, had it analyzed, they may be drinking water that's way above the drinking water standard. So I'm going to come back to that drinking water standard in a minute. So we've taken data like those for all of the state of Florida. Over 20,000 data points went into making this map. Um, this looks a lot like uh, the mold that's growing on your coffee. You know, when you come back in on Monday after you left your coffee out on Friday. Uh, this mold looking is the groundwater nitrate levels in the groundwater of all of Florida. A blue is the background. Basically, uh, all of Florida was blue historically in terms of groundwater nitrate levels based on the data we have. And then you got higher and higher levels. And remember that I said the drinking water standard's 10, which is right up here. Anything red is above the drinking water standard. The spring standard is right here for springs. That's the standard's 0.35 parts per million. Uh, so anything that's lit up at all on this map uh, that groundwater, if it's coming out of a spring, it's, it's against the law to have that level. It's, it's, we have a numeric nutrient standard for nitrate, and we see we're well above that for a very large part of, the spring, of Florida. And this is all of Florida. Now, we're not talking about contaminating a gas station site or something like that. We've contaminated 30-some million acres of Florida with nitrate, a very large part of it. In fact, uh, uh, using the spring standard of 0.35, a full third of the state is above that level, and above one, which is this going to this darker orange, uh, about 18% of the state is above that level. So um, we've, we've really created a monster here in terms of the future uh, for uh, safe drinking water. This is our drinking water. This is the exact same water. If you have a well, this is what you're drinking. And if you're in western Marion County, if you're in western Alachua County, if you're in High Springs drinking the water out of the tap here, 
you're drinking something above one milligram per liter right now. Okay, well, how bad is that? The drinking water standard's 10. Well, that, maybe that's not a problem. So let's blow that up a little bit. We're at High Springs, which is right here. Um, we analyzed the, the drinking water from all the cities around here. They're all a little above one, about 1 1.2. Uh, some are as high as two. Um, you go down to where Zephyr Hills gets their water, they're over two milligrams per liter there. The, the spring water that it says Zephyr Hills on it is over two milligrams per liter, which is even higher, obviously. Uh, and then there's areas where it's perfectly, the water's safe, it doesn't have any nitrate at all. But there's a large area in this spring's country uh, that is highly vulnerable to fertilizer and to impact. So Wakaiba Springs is down here uh, near Brooksville, um, and not Wakaiba, yeah, Wikiwachi, I mean. And these are the data, the nitrate data for Wikiwachi over time. So you can, you can see, this is the spring standard here, Wikiwachi uh, nitrate levels, um, we don't have any data before 1970, but they've been coming up ever since. Phosphorus is not coming up. Phosphorus is another ingredient in fertilizer. It's not showing up in the groundwater at all. Um, and that's an interesting part of the chemistry of phosphorus. But nitrate is showing up uh, from fertilizer and from wastewaters. And it's, there's another map that shows how this aligns with population. As the population goes up, the nitrogen levels go up. And so it's, it's not just agriculture, it's urban development does it the same thing. These people are down there uh, extracting algae from Wikiwachi Springs. Wikiwachi Springs has been totally covered with algae. The state went in and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars dredging it out. It all just came back in a matter of months. It's like getting a haircut. You go remove the algae that looks so bad and it just grows back. Uh, and so people are desperate to do something about it. And they're, they're basically treating the symptoms. I mean, this is like, to me, this is the myth of Sisyphus. I mean, this is this is out of Greek tragedy that we've contaminated our water so much that we have to go out and basically be a slave to remove the pollution from our water manually. And this is being done a number of places, Kings Bay, Crystal River is where this one rake at a time exercise started. It's, it's just a sad testament to what we've allowed to happen to our springs. So we have data from about 140 springs, I think are on here, 130. Um, about 95% of our springs now have elevated nitrate above background levels. The background is about 0.05. And you can find your favorite spring on here. Fanning was the highest one on this chart. But like I said, we're studying a spring right now that's over 60, which would be up there at the top of the room. Uh, Convict Spring is more than double Fanning Spring. Uh, so there's some other springs you may know about that are much higher. But a lot of our springs are high. There's the spring standard. Uh, so about 77% of our springs are above the state standard that we're not supposed to go above ever. Um, and the, the effect of nitrogen on springs is still uncertain. It's not the only factor that's making algae growth, the filamentous algae growth in springs. It's really uncertain how much of that effect is due to nitrogen. Because we have some springs that have very little nitrogen and have a lot of algae. And so there are other factors contributing to algae as well. And in this, in this spring, the algae is growing so densely over the vallison area, which is the, no, the native grass that grows in the springs, that it totally smothers the grass. And you've, you may have been to Manatee Springs or Fanning Springs, and all the native grasses that used to be in those springs is gone now. It's all algae. That's the only thing that typically grows in those springs. So algae outcompetes these plants, and what's contributing to the algae is still open to discussion. This is a picture of Wakulla Springs in the 1960s. These are the native grasses that were in our springs. Uh, this picture in 2013. Uh, basically, the native grasses are gone in a lot of Wakulla Springs and Wakulla River, and it's algae now. And this is just true for more and more of our springs. Manatee Springs, uh, Fanning Springs. Uh, this, is, this is sort of the new normal for springs, unfortunately, for your generation. Uh, we can go back. But let's talk a little bit more about where nitrogen comes from. It doesn't just come from agriculture and fertilizers. It also comes from people, directly from people, in terms of our waste. And all humans excrete nitrogen. It's in your waste products. Um, and it turns out a lot of us are on septic tanks. In fact, there's about 4 million people 
using septic tanks for their wastewater uh, treatment and disposal in Florida, about two million septic tanks. Uh, just in the Wakiva spring shed, that spring shed I showed you earlier where all those wells were, uh, there are 45,000 single family uh, on-site systems, there are septic tank systems. Um, there's still a lot of septic tanks in High Springs. I mean, you know, not every city has connected every house up to a central wastewater plant. Well, the Department of Health did a big study of, of nitrogen sources in this area, and so they went to private wells. They went to private wells, sampled 6,600 of these private wells, and this is the figure that uh, DEP produced from those data. 400 of the wells out of 6,600 were above 10 milligrams per liter. So that's, I think, 6% of the wells were above that. So if there's, uh, I don't remember how many, but there's about 100,000 people living here. So um, at least 6,000 people are drinking water above 10, and probably. You know, it, and this, this area hasn't been remediated. It has been changed some. The citrus has taken, been taken off a lot of this area, and citrus uh, fertilizer was part of the problem here. But there's still a lot of people drinking high nitrogen wastewater. Um, and part of it's from their own septic tanks. Okay, if you've got a small lot and you've got a septic tank and you've got a well, you're drinking, part of the water you're drinking is your own effluent. And if you're surrounded by neighbors on small lots, which is the way it is here in this area, uh, you're drinking, every, everybody's drinking each other's waste, which is a scary thought. And we should be scared of it. What, what we need to do is clean up that waste better and not put such high density of septic tanks out on the land. Septic tanks work fine if you've got five acres, but if you're on a half an acre or a quarter of an acre, it's a bad, it's a bad idea to have a septic tank near your well. Uh, here's a fun picture. Uh, this is our photographer here, uh, Tess. But anyway, this uh, picture just represents the fact that we're drinking the same water the springs are drinking. We're drinking the same water that the manatees are drinking, the fish are drinking, all these animals that live in our springs. We're drinking that same water. At 10 parts per million, it's known to cause metho metho methamoglobinemia, which is blue baby syndrome, which is an oxygen starvation of infants that can kill them. And then at two parts per million, those levels that are in Zephyr Hills spring water, it's been implicated in a, a two to three fold increased risk of cancer. So this isn't something that you see right away. This is the, the analogy of the frog. You put a frog in boiling water and he'll jump out. And if you put a frog in cold water and then gradually raise the temperature, he won't jump out. You don't know that you're being poisoned when you're getting cancer. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, a significant body of data that indicates that this water that, that we just take for granted now could be causing cancer. So um, that means we should do something about it, I think. Um, but we haven't yet. They're still being ignored. So the two issues I talked about, has anybody got a time? Can you give me an update on the time? 12.47. 12, thank you, Jess. Uh, the two main things I talked about today are excessive groundwater use, which is competing with the flow of springs, and the increased pollution of nitrogen springs. So, we, both of those things, what we're finding about flow that we didn't really realize more than 10 years ago is that flow is very important for algae also. If there's enough flow, enough velocity in springs, it actually washes the algae out and it doesn't allow the proliferation of excessive amounts of the native grasses. Um, but these things are combined, somehow are increasing the algae in springs, it's reducing the presence of native plants so we see an area that was and aquatic plants now is dominated by algae in this picture. It's impairing water quality, not just in the spring, but downstream. The nitrogen is a pollutant in our estuaries. It's a major pollutant in our estuaries. It, it, did anybody see the pictures uh, this last year of the algal blooms down in Fort Myers and in, uh, um, in St. Lucie Harbor and places like that? They said the algae was so thick, they said it looked like guacamole. You know what guacamole is, the green stuff we love putting on chips. Uh, anyway, that, they're fighting the same thing. Nitrogen in the marine environment is a big pollutant causing algal blooms. Uh, there's less food for the wildlife. Algae isn't pal palatable. The studies that UF is doing right now at Silver Springs indicate that nothing wants to eat the film as algae. There's, the, there, there's good algae and there's bad algae, it turns out. And the good algae is the food in these springs that used to be in these springs. And there's less of that and more of the bad stuff. So there's less food. I mean. 
the plants and the algae are the publics of the springs. You know, the, the fish can't go to Publix to buy their food, right? And there's not people out there throwing fish food in every day. They gotta grow, you gotta grow it right there. And if, if your system is crashing, the ecology system's crashing, and you don't have the food being produced, the wildlife goes away. So we have less wildlife. We have lower fish numbers, uh, lower uh, turtle numbers and things like that. And, and then for humans, we, we're selfish. We like to think of springs as our playground and there's less aesthetic uh, value for our springs. So those are all big problems. Of course, lowering aquifer levels is associated with sinkhole formation. So you get lower aquifer levels. When you have lower aquifer levels, you get saltwater intrusion. You get sinkhole formation. Uh, you get dry lakes. Uh, your springs, when your springs don't flow as much, your rivers don't flow as much. So the, the Suwannee River has lost about 30 or 40 percent of its flow. The Santa Fe River has lost uh, 30 or 40 percent of its flow. They're, they're not the same as they used to be. And that's because, uh, and, and we've subtracted out rainfall changes on that. That's because of pumping. Uh, more pumping, really, when you give somebody a permit to pump a lot of water, they tend to use a lot more fertilizer. And, and so it's like you're giving somebody a, a free pass to use fertilizer when you give them a water permit. So that means we get more pollution. And then once we get more nitrate, we have an unhealthy aquifer, one that I don't want to drink from, um, one that the springs don't really want to drink from, but don't have any choice. And it's affecting our rivers and our estuaries. And so sick waters diminish everybody's quality of life. This is, this is a, a public health issue, a pub, an economic issue. Uh, we're reducing the value. The million people a year coming through here are not going to look at polluted, they don't want to go look at polluted springs. And it's become our dry springs. It's becoming clearer and clearer uh, that those things are happening, and they're, see they're seeing that. And I'm looking for John's picture of you know, the kayak paddle back there with the algae. That, the Santa Fe River actually stopped flowing in 2012 and just became a cesspool. This part of the Santa Fe River south of here. The springs above Ginny Springs, above Blue Springs, stopped flowing, all of them. The river stopped flowing, and it just became uh, just a, nothing but floating algae, dead fish. It was a mess, and it's been documented. So these are some fun pictures we made of Silver Springs. What happens if the biggest spring in Florida stops flowing? Well, you know, it's got mud cake crack. This, these aren't real pictures. These are manufactured pictures. But this is uh, one of the threats. And I'm going to tell you some of the real things that are happening at Silver Springs. This is a real picture of Silver Springs from 2009. When I studied Silver Springs, there was none of this in the 70s, none of this type of algae. Uh, that you could see the plants were still green. They had a, a slight covering of the good algae, the diatoms. They had snails all over them, constantly feeding on that. Uh, there was uh, 10 times as many fish in Silver River as there are now. Uh, and this is the way it looks now. And so I recently uh, was looking at what's happening there. And um, these are, this is the rainfall. The yellowish line is the rainfall and the annual rainfall totals. And this is the blue line is the flow at Silver Springs. I showed you already how it started down in the 1980s. And around 1990, it really accelerated. And it's just going down very rapidly now. In spite of the fact that there, the district, the water management district, thinks there's really not any more pumping going on now than there was 20 years ago. But it, the flows are still going down. And like I said, they've gone down. As of this year right now, they're down at 385 cubic feet per second right there. So. Yeah, well, you know, I showed early on the, the amount of water being used by the groundwater being used by the pumping. In the 50s, there were 2 million people in Florida. There's 20 million now. It's a lot more people. So it, that's definitely part of it. The amount we're using for public supply and for personal use is, is going up as the population increases. But the actual amount being used individually is, is going down in most parts of the state. People are using, people are more conscious of water, wasting water, uh, but it's just not enough. I mean, we're, we're still adding population. A thousand new people a day is the, the average number coming to Florida. So we looked at those data and plotted them by uh, time periods. And for the period up through 1989, when you got 52 inches of rain a year, uh, you got about 800 cubic feet per second out of Silver Springs. Uh, in 1990 to 99, you only got 730 cubic feet per second for the same amount of rain. 
uh, in, in 2000 and 2009, you were down to 560 cubic feet per second. In 2010 and 16, you were down to 530. This, this basically takes out the effect of rainfall on spring flow, doing this analysis, where you're doing a regression for these different time periods. And so it, it indicates to me that about 34% of the reduction in Silver Springs is due to factors other than rainfall, it's just approximately. It's lost about a, almost a third of its flow due to pumping. The only other factor is, is pumping, uh, really. Um, this is an interesting graph prepared by the Water Management District that shows the flow velocities in the Silver River. These X's are individual measurements of flow velocity in the Silver River when they measure flow there. And um, we, in research recently, we've seen that there's a threshold that where the algae gets washed away. If you have high flows, the algae gets stripped out and the plants are green again. It looks very different. Uh, and so silver up through the 1990s, like I said, it had, you know, the flow was started coming down, the velocity started coming down, but it didn't go below the threshold until about the mid 1990s. And that's when we first started seeing algae in Silver Springs. So uh, at this, when we had velocities up here, the flow was close to 800 cubic feet per second, then it's down to 740, then it's down to 700, now it's down to about 500. And we're below that threshold, and that's why silver apparently has all this algae in it. If you put the historic flow back in silver, this algae wouldn't be here is what I would predict right now based on the data that we have. Uh, this is the, these are the nitrate levels at Silver Springs. The earliest data we have is from the early 1900s when it was about uh, half a, uh, 0.05 parts per million. It's gone up about 3,600 percent since 1907. It's at 1.4 now um, parts per million and rising. Uh, we did an estimate in 2005 of how much nitrogen was coming down the Silver River from the springs. It's 500 tons per year, and we estimated what it would be in 2055 if development kept on in Marion County. And almost. So this is a cute cartoon. Um, Jake Fuller is our local artist that a lot of people don't agree with in the Gainesville Sun, but he, um, as we're uh, challenging the district about the minimum flows allowable for Silver Springs, he, he did this cartoon. And uh, it's sort of like those earlier ones that Rick Kilby did. So I have bombarded you with facts and figures. Uh, I encourage you to read. These are the executive summaries for individual restoration plans that we've done for many of the springs. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can read those. They only take about 15 or 20 minutes to read one of these. If that's above your level, we have a cartoon book here. Uh, has anybody got a copy that you can hold up? Tess, I guess not. Um, yeah, there's a coloring book here that we produced um, in honor of one of the Springs Hunters, a group of people that are really uh, going around documenting the Springs. And, uh, and so that's a good way to take it to your children or to your brother, or younger brother and sister, or if you're one of the older people that likes to color now, that's a good thing for you to do. So thank you, everybody, for your being here today and your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.